Over to you, Robert. All right, thank you very much, Kim. And welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Robert Glasgow. I'm a partner at McCarthy Tetro uh, and I'm in our international trade and investment law group. I'd like to welcome all of you back for part two in our deep dive into Canadian procurement law. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge that we are here on the territorial lands of uh, various Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Métis, the Credit First Credit First Nations, and uh, many others all across Canada uh, on whose traditional territorial lands we reside. We encourage all of you to investigate and learn more about the uh, many Indigenous peoples across Canada whose rich cultural history intertwines with our own and is part of the fabric of the country known as Canada today. I'd like to begin by getting into contract A. Uh, so as you might tell from the presentation today's note is contract A is bad, set it on fire. Uh, this might give you some clue on where I'm going with this and on my own personal biases and my own personal beliefs around contract A. Uh, those views are probably very accurate. So getting into our roadmap, I'd like to start off by pointing out that we have session one and session one was recorded. If you did not tune in and want to tune in on that session, you can. Uh, you can uh, find it online. It's on the McCarthy Tetra website that goes into Canada's trade agreements and various trade obligations and how to bring complaints around those agreements and what some of those obligations are. Today we're on session two, and this is more of a foundational session on general procurement obligations and where they come from, and then whether or not we can escape some of those obligations and move into a non-binding RFP format, or what we call an NRFP or an NRFX in order to cover off RFQs, RFSQs, and all the uh, alphabet soup of the various different types of procurements that can be run. I'm gonna to conclude today by going over a few case studies of cases that have stuck out to me as having very particular principles around them uh, and very particular issues that need to be highlighted and really delved into uh, in my mind. So again, the general procurement landscape, this will be familiar to those of you who tuned in last time. Again, Canada has a very large public procurement market. It's more than $130 billion annually. And again, many of those purchasers are SME, uh, many of those purchasers buy heavily from SMEs and other local uh, entities. And a lot of those entities have procurement commitments that cover the entire world. We have the procurement landscape, which we also talked a bit about last time. And last time we stuck mostly on the left-hand side of this diagram, on the governance and on the trade agreements. Today, we're gonna to do a bit more of a delve into everything to the right of that. We're gonna spend some time talking about contractual obligations, about binding formats, contract A and contract B, before moving over to the non-binding formats. And we're also gonna to touch a little bit on those internal governance issues and various statutes and regulations that provide at least some constraint. Now I say some constraint, because again, it's very important to note that unlike some other jurisdictions in the common law world and in the civil law world uh, that have a strong rule book statute based procurement system, a lot of Canada lacks that. A lot of it is a hodgepodge of various different statutes and different regulations and different policies that can be very specific to particular entities and very specific to particular government institutions. And so it's very important that you drill down and find those right entities. So the overview, Canada's competitive advantage, uh, as you might say, which is litigation. Canada is the most litigious procurement market in the world. Uh, this always shocks and surprises, particularly American lawyers when I'm talking to them, because a lot of American lawyers take, I, I want to say, pride, perhaps, in the litigiousness of the American legal system. But when it comes specifically to procurement law, the Americans do not hold a candle to the Canadian system. And that's because in Canada, you can have essentially a double-barreled lawsuit. You can pursue both civil damages for lost profits, 
and administrative actions or administrative remedies for things like retendering, reevaluations, standstills, et cetera. Those are powers that aren't generally available in other jurisdictions, particularly in other common law jurisdictions. Uh, and those give massive incentives towards litigation. And in particular, the ability to seek lost profits in a civil action is a huge incentive to bidders to bring claims against purchasers. Uh, and that's because just speaking frankly, from a risk reward standpoint, if you are working for a supplier and you're in your counsel's office and your procurement people come to you and say, well, we think the government screwed us over in this contract and we wanna bring a legal claim. You know, the first question is gonna be, you know, how strong of a claim do we have? But then an equally important question is going to be, what's the outcome? What do we get from this? What's, what's the ultimate remedy going to be? And in many common law jurisdictions in this world, the remedy for a breach of a procurement obligation by a purchaser is simply administrative. It's there has to be a reevaluation or there has to be a retender or there has to be a, a new award. And considering that the most common one there is we have to reevaluate some of these bids, it becomes much more difficult for a supplier to get the buy-in from a business perspective to bring a claim, because you have to be able to convince uh, the powers that be that number one, we stand a chance at winning, and then number two, if we win, we can also win the actual RFP if things are evaluated fairly. So it's, you know, you're taking a big gamble with litigation resources to take a gamble that you can win the RFP. If you have a lost profits claim though, if you can make a breach of contract lost profits claim, then that suddenly flips it because now it's no longer we're bringing this claim to potentially have the chance to win. It's we're bringing this claim to get a big pot of money. And getting a big pot of money is an attractive concept, particularly because you can use those resources that were going to fulfill the contract to get that big pot of money to get a second big pot of money. So really, it's a better pitch. So if you're a supplier, being in this world gives you an incentive to sue. And if you're a purchaser, being in this world gives you an incentive to avoid risk at all costs. Because you know, even a minor error, even small issues can greatly incentivize the bringing of a claim. So this causes a massive amount of gridlock and a lot of awkwardness in the gears. So how do we get here? How do we get to this place of risk aversion and easy supplier complaints? And one of the ways we got here is the Queen and Rod Engineering. Now, I don't wanna spend a huge amount of time on this, but this just gives you a very brief rundown of the key cases. We have the Queen and Rod Engineering, which sets up this contract A, contract B monster that I'm going to get to. MJB Enterprises, which kind of sets out that you form that with compliant bidders and compliant bidders alone. But there's, there's a little wrinkle in MJB that we'll get to that's really quite interesting. And you flow down through Turcon, you have questions about what privilege clauses can do and what privilege clauses can't do. Uh, you have things like design services, which gets into, can we try to evade the contract Reach a contract issue, especially for subcontractors who have no privity with a prime by alleging a tort of some sort. And then, of course, we have questions around your duty to investigate and your ability to negotiate, particularly post bid negotiations, which comes up in double N. So the key question here is what's binding us anyway? What's, you know, what's this binding thing? So when I talk about a binding procurement process, I'm talking about what we got with the Queen and Ron Engineering. Now, here's the big question here that I always like to ask. And I actually taught a, a class on procurement at Western just this past Monday, and I kind of put it out to them. And it's, it's easier for them because they just did the reading. But the question I always like to ask here is, what was the Queen and Ron Engineering about? Like at its core, what was the complaint there? And the complaint in the Queen and Ron Engineering 
It was about a bid bond. It was about whether or not there was a mistake in the winning bidder's contract that was sufficient to vitiate its intent to enter the contract and thus say it did not have to pay back the bid bond. They don't have to pay the bid bond and this uh, queen in this case suing to recover the bid bond amount. So here we created, the Supreme Court looked at this bid bond situation and they created this odd issue. They created this contract A, contract B framework to govern the relationship between the parties. And the contract A that the court came up with is what they called the bidding contract. And the bidding contract is the solicitation documents that are put out by the purchaser that set out the express rules, terms, and conditions that will apply to the procurement process. It's very clear that that is not the final contract that's being procured. The service that's being procured is what we would call contract B. That's what's entered into with the successful proponent from contract A. That contract A will include a large variety of very complicated rules. It will set out rules for how you can submit proposals when you have to submit them by, what kind of bid security you have to buy, what the scope for negotiation is, how bids are going to be evaluated, what time periods bids are binding for. In other words, what are the rules around when bidders are allowed to remove their bids? So these are all very complicated rules. The bidders bind themselves by making their bid, by putting in a compliant bid. And once they've put in a compliant bid, part of this, and this gets back to the Ron engineering case, is that that bid becomes irrevocable. So if you are the winning bidder and the purchaser comes to you and says, I want you now to perform, if you do not perform, you're in breach of contract. And the purchaser can either enforce the bid bond or bid security of some other type, or they can go after you to try to seek uh, some mitigation for the additional costs they have to incur by going with the second cheapest bid. Conversely, there are a whole slew of duties that start to be imposed on the purchaser. So you have duties of fairness and disclosure of, to all bidders. You have to provide them with adequate time to submit their proposal. You have to have no bias in what you are doing. You have to have no conflicts of interest. As you can see from this slide, if you just look at all those duties that are now imposed on a purchaser, those are fairly extensive. And it must be said that not only are those very extensive duties, but those duties that are imposed on the public purchaser are evaluated by the court at a very high level. The court does not think that you can just skip over these. And most of the cases, take a very strict view of what purchasers are allowed to do and not allowed to do to get over this contract aid duty hurdle. So unsurprisingly, we see a lot of cases of contract aid challenges and a lot of them are successful. And so what are some common indicators that were in contract A? You know, what's that blinking red light, so to speak? And that blinking, blinking red light, the number one at least like to me that you're on contract A, is the irrevocability of bids. Because that's really one of the key pieces of consideration that a bidder or a supplier is giving to a purchaser. It's saying that if I am chosen, I am bound that I must perform this contract as I have bid it. That's a huge concession that bidders are making, at least in the court's eyes, and thus, that's a big piece of consideration. So if you have that kind of irrevocability, it then becomes hard to say, well, we're not really in a situation where we owe them any kind of non-reciprocal duties, that you don't owe them some sort of implied duties of fairness. Uh, other common ones uh, that kind of come up as key indicators that you're in a contract A is if the bidders are being told that they must accept a very particular form of contract. For example, if you've delineated exacting specifications on exactly how everything's supposed to go and there are strict legal terms that cannot be negotiated or varied and bidders just must bid to that particular contract, you're much more likely to be in contract A. If you are uh, 
instead going out there and giving broad scopes of negotiation. If you're going out there and saying that a lot of terms are to be negotiated, if you're allowing bidders a lot more flexibility, then it's something that's much more likely not to be in contract day. And it's worth noting that this contract day framework, while it started to catch on in a few cases in other Commonwealth jurisdictions, is again, largely a Canadian uh, construct. It's not actually the norm in many other jurisdictions. And this is one common problem that we see when we're dealing with US counsel and we're dealing with US companies that are coming to Canada, which is they'll enter into the market, they'll have their bid set up as if they are bidding on a US contract, the bid is accepted, they will go to start the negotiations because again, in the US system, the RFP is more of a springboard for negotiations with the purchaser to nail down terms. And they're told, no, 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 you have to perform exactly as you set it out. And that can cause massive problems because now you have a bidder who didn't understand that that's what they were doing. And that's why it's very important if you are in contract day to understand the scope and the limits of the system that you are operating in, which is why it's bad. Uh, and I say this as someone uh, who values systems over my own personal profits, because let's be honest here, if there's more litigation, it's generally good for procurement lawyers and particularly procurement litigators. It's actually something that's very good for us. It's good for us in terms of helping purchasers to avoid contract aid problems and to make sure that you're on side. My concern more is over the system and the system as a whole, because contract A is heavily weighted in favor of suppliers. The duties and the benefits that a purchaser receives in contract A is largely in the form of the irrevocability. It's knowing that you have someone there to perform. For all of the suppliers, contract A gives them that lost profits motivation that they can jump onto and that they can pursue. And that protection that they get and the ability to seek those lost profits is a massive boon to a supplier. But from a systems perspective, as I said, it gums up the works. It makes suppliers very uh, risk aware and very keen to know where they might be able to recover some funds. And it makes purchasers very risk averse and it slows the system down, makes bidding more expensive for suppliers because you know those costs do get passed on uh, and it just makes the whole situation worse, which is why in the last few years, the market has been increasingly embracing non-binding RFPs, or as I like to say, setting contract A on fire. And that's basically saying contract A is dumb. We should not do it. We should not be concerned with contract A. We should be looking at what the rest of the world does. We should be looking at how the Americans do procurement, how the Europeans do procurement. And we should be trying to replicate systems where procurement is done more efficiently and with less risk that in the end benefits everyone on the aggregate. So what are we doing here? Well, when we're looking at a negotiable RFP system, we're looking instead of tendering for a specific contract, instead of saying, this is our contract A to enter into contract B. Instead we say, this is our solicitation, this is our RFP, in which we are looking for proposals to enter into negotiations on. And that's why it's also sometimes called a negotiable RFP. Because instead of bidding for a specific contract, it's bidding to be the preferred proponent to enter into negotiations to come to a binding agreement. So what are some key features here? Well, you just take that blinking red light list, you gotta flip it on its head. So you're typically looking at situations where there are no periods of irrevocability. Bidders are free to walk away. They may fly at their heart's content, even after bids have closed, even during the negotiation period, every minute until the time on which the dotted line is signed on that final contract, a bidder can walk away without penalty, without fear that they will be sued, or that there will be any kind of bid security drawn on, which is why also another key component of this is also usually there's no bid securities. 
there's no bid bonds. And I say that and I can feel some long-term procurement professionals kind of sucking in at the thought of no bid bonds, to which I would just ask, think back across your entire career and ask yourself, how many times have you successfully invoked a bid bond and successfully enforced a bid bond? There might be a few cases. There, there, there very well might be. But I would venture that those are relatively few in number. And then contrast that with the number of times you've either been sued over a contract A issue, or you have had to consult outside legal counsel or your own internal GC office and get opinions about whether or not something would violate contract A, and all the added legal expense of doing that process. And when you start to think about it in terms of that cost benefit, suddenly from a purchaser's perspective, getting rid of contract A seems like not that terrible of an idea. So another common feature we see with the no contract A format is that there's usually a clause that expressly says there is no contract A here. Uh, this is said in a number of different ways. We'll get to an example clause later on in the case studies that's actually been upheld by uh, at least one court in Canada uh, that goes through just saying, look, everyone agrees there's no contract A, both purchasers and bidders. There's also usually no liability for a bidder who breaches the procurement documents. The only liability here is that you're non-compliant, so your bid will not be considered going forward. Uh, I should uh, just ask one other thing. If you have a question, I should have said this at the outset, please don't use the chat feature, use the question and answer feature uh, in the uh, uh, Zoom function, it's easier, it pops up much more evidently on my screen. So having addressed some of those periods, we then have the two principles of negotiation. We have a rank and run consecutive negotiation process, and we have a best and final offer a concurrent negotiation process. Uh, the rank and run process is something that might be very familiar to most of you. It's what most of us think of in terms of the consecutive uh, uh, of a negotiable RFP, where you come up with the process, you score your, your bidders, you rank your bidders, and you enter into negotiations with that top ranked bidder. Uh, and once you've concluded with them, you award that contract. Or if you can't come to a conclusion with that top ranked bidder after a specified period, drop down to bidder number two and continue until you reach the end. The other format is a best and final offer of concurrent negotiations. This is also something that's very valid and can be done with this system. And under a concurrent negotiation process, uh, you will have um, a, uh, a number of different ways you can do it. You can have various rounds where you look at different elements of the RFP. You can look holistically. One very common way that a best and final offer is used is you use the first round to hash out compliance and technical terms to essentially set a threshold. And then you pass through all the bidders that you think meet your threshold on, this is an acceptable bid. Like if I get the solution, I will be happy with it. And then on the BAFO side, you say, okay, now that those parts are frozen, we're gonna negotiate with all of you concurrently and have a common submission date for your final bid on price. And then because all of you are over the hump on the technicals and we like all of your submissions, this is just gonna be a straight out drag race on price. And you can use that to create a competitive tension if you're uh, a purchaser. And that kind of dialogue and back and forth of a BAFO system is also something you can do if you are outside the strictures of contract A. Because if you think about it, if you're trying to do that kind of discussion after big close, that might end up altering some of the scope, might end up altering price. All of this is something that would immediately be screaming bid shopping, bid shopping, bid shopping, or bid repair. Uh, that's not really a concern when you don't have those contract A obligations, which gets to the question of what are a lot of those obligations uh, that we're avoiding? So if you have this, you can now accept a non-compliant bid. That's one I generally would not advise relying on, uh, but it's theoretically possible because you now no longer have contract A uh, obligations. Uh, 
You also have uh, the question of the duty of fairness and the duty to award the contract that may be avoided. You get the increased flexibility because now instead of specifying each and every step of what you want, you can leave the situation open and you can leave it more open to provide innovative solutions. This is also something very common if you are a cloud processor, if you're doing an IT procurement or as a supplier or a purchaser, most suppliers that I'm aware of have their own commercial paper in this space and they have their standard terms and for a variety of very good legal reasons, they can't get off of those, but they're also all different from each other. So it can be almost impossible to design a procurement that's fair that will allow this unless you allow for the scope of increased negotiations. Uh, that also helps increase competitive tension because now you have more interest and more people want to bid. For suppliers, it increases your scope of what you can bid on. It also allows for a degree of bid rectification. And in this, what I'm getting at is uh, in some contracts, you'll end up seeing a, uh, a pure ladder or a pure process that in effectively enables a staggered submission process whereby bidders are invited to submit a preliminary bid essentially uh, that will be examined and will be assessed for um, its uh, compliance with the mandatory terms and then the purchaser will be able to go back to them and say, look, you guys are non-compliant with the following terms. And usually this is set out as a very structured process, again, in order to remain fair to all bidders. And I'll come back to the importance of fairness. But to be fair to all bidders, you come out to all of them simultaneously. You have a standardized form for how you send out uh, what potential non-compliances there are, you provide a common deadline to address the non-compliances. And for a particularly a complex procurement, by allowing this kind of cure process, you can help eliminate some of the issues that can sometimes crop up under contract A that form a very common risk factor, which is, is this a material non-compliance or not? Because that question of material non-compliance, not material non-compliance, that's a very risk fraught area to get into. And you're putting your you know, fate in the hands of a judge and speaking just as a lawyer who's been to court and lost cases I think I should have won and won cases I think I probably should have lost. It's not always the best idea to put your hand, you know, your fate in the hands of a judge when you can try to avoid it by avoiding contract A. And the last issue that comes here is even if you breach some sort of duty, even if there's an issue that comes up, because there's no contract A, there is no claim for lost profits, or at least shouldn't be, because that lost profits claim is based upon a contractual damages principle from a breach of contract claim. If there is no contract A, there can be no breach of contract, and thus there could be no lost profits claim. Now, of course, you still have to worry about potential tort claims and judicial reviews, which we'll touch on, but those both become a lot more difficult than bringing the breach of contract claim in a traditional contract A situation. But it does have its drawbacks. Destroying contract A isn't perfect from a purchaser's perspective. I mean, from a supplier's perspective, the obvious drawback is you can no longer seek lost profits if you're not in contract A. If you are a purchaser, one of the biggest drawbacks is you no longer have that irrevocability. And this again worries a lot of people. But as I said, bid bonds are very rarely enforced. But also what's important here is that bidders don't want to retract their bids outside of when they've made a mistake. Bidders typically want to do the work they've bid on. Bidders are smart people that are motivated and want to do work because then they get paid. So, the chances that people revoke are already low. And it gets even lower when you think about it from a human psychological perspective. We, as a matter of science, know that humans are loss averse. At the point, especially if you're doing a rank and run procurement, for example, if a bidder finds out they are the top ranked proponent, the incentive to revoke that bid 
suddenly becomes a lot lower because they have it in their hands. They can taste it. They can feel that they have the successful bid. And then are they really just going to walk away over some minor terms and sculpting that you want to do, some you know, changes in scope or you know, a minor reduction in price? Is that really worth losing the entire contract? That's a tough sell. And it's a tough sell not only from a human psychological perspective for the people who are actually engaged in the negotiation, but it's also a tough sell to sell up the chain to tell your bosses and your boss's bosses that you know, we had this work that we wanted to do, we were going to make a profit, but then we just decided we didn't want to. Conversely, if they are walking away, or if you do feel you need to walk away, it's probably for a very good reason. There's probably, a, it's probably not a minor thing, especially when you can negotiate a great deal of the scope in a non-binding procurement. And if you're a purchaser, do you really want to try to force performance from a supplier that doesn't, that isn't all in, that has some significant issues that they don't want to, that they just can't get over to do the contract. That becomes a, a question that maybe you're better off going with the second rank proponent and negotiating with them to try to make them a better bid for your needs. Uh, the other big thing that kind of can come up here is that there is still some legal risk. And this is what I was talking about in terms of uh, administrative remedies and why fairness still matters. Because you still have the potential for, for example, a judicial review. Because most purchasers who are going to be in this situation are going to be public law purchasers uh, and government entities and creatures of statute. And a lot of times when you're purchasing, and this gets back into what I said about part one, if you're not purchasing for a commercial purpose, for example, for reselling liquor to the public or reselling insurance services to the public, but you're instead procuring for your own, to fulfill your governmental purpose, then you're probably doing it to fulfill your statutory purpose. And that's probably, not certainly, but probably going to be a public law duty that's subject to judicial review. Uh, this can be highly dependent upon what the entity is and what the specific statutes that created the entity and the powers that that entity is exercising. However, it's worth noting that in the federal government, there is strong case law. It's the Rapiscan case that judicial review is available, uh, at least in certain circumstances, particularly where there is no contract A or there's a disclaimer of contract A uh, because now there's no longer any uh, alternative remedy. Similarly, at the provincial level, there have been cases that have been litigated, we'll get into a few, that do either go the JR route or try going a damages route, and we're told you can't do this, but the result might have been different if you sought judicial review. So your risk remains. That said, if you're a purchaser, the risk of the administrative remedy is probably lower for you than the risk of the contractual remedy. And that's because the administrative remedies, generally speaking, in the jurisdictions I'm aware of, don't result in a damages claim. They often result in things like needing to do a reevaluation or a review or a retender at the outside, but that's probably a much rarer circumstances that would require you as a purchaser to have screwed up something really, really terribly. Uh, it's also worth noting you as a purchaser, depending on what type of entity you are, may not even be subject to that. And one, one of the interesting examples that we'll touch on is the BPS procurement directive and whether or not that is truly binding in a way that's judicially reviewable. So getting into some case studies uh, before we touch into questions, because I actually have quite a few questions that have popped up uh, and see if I answer any of them through this. The first is the Marine Atlantic, or what I like to call the landmine RFP. So in the Marine Atlantic uh, case, it's a federal crown corporation in Newfoundland and Labrador, and the province is taking over a ferry service. So Marine Atlantic wants to issue a tender call uh, for a long-term contract. Instead of doing the long-term contract, which is what it's always done in the past, it called up three different providers to submit proposals for a short-term arrangement just until certainty could be arrived at. Top Sale, who's the plaintiff in this case, uh, and the, uh, uh, spoiler alert, successful plaintiff in this case, was the lowest price bid, but it didn't win. 
It brought an action claiming breach of duty of fairness under contract A. And they alleged that Marine Atlantic had engaged in contract discussions with its competitors during the bidding process. Now, Marine Atlantic did exactly what I would have advised, which is brought a summary dismissal motion saying that solicitation was not an RFP and that they owe no duty of fairness under contract A. And that's because in the RFP documents, it said there is no contract A. No contract A is being formed as part of this RFP. And so what they did is exactly what I think is the right course of action, which is they said, if you look at MJB Enterprises, under that case, the very first question the court asks, even though they don't really answer it, they just kind of assume it's true is, is there a contract A? That's the threshold question. And that's the question from which all of this spills. And so the correct approach is to say there is none, the summary judgment, no contract A, no contract A, no breach of contract, no breach of contract, we all get to go home, give us our costs. That's usually the right approach. There's an issue. Top Sale argued there was a contract A because this wasn't just a straight up RFP. There was a pre-qualification where the bidders uh, were pre-qualified under a contract A framework. And thus, because the framework was established as being contract A from the beginning, it was owed a duty of fairness. Now, here's the issue. As I said, the contract, the RFP documents said no contract A. But before that RFP happened, to find the three bidders that got sent the RFP, a procurement officer picked up the phone and started calling around to the three different suppliers, including the current incumbent, then Top Sale, who had been the provider before the incumbent, and then uh, another provider. And started phoning around to say, hey, look, we're looking for an RFP uh, for bidders for this RFP. It will be on the same terms as our previous solicitations. Uh, are you interested? And what will you be bidding? And they responded back with some specific vessels that they would bid on if they were going to be given the case. And it's important to note that, that those previous solicitations that the bidders were told this bid would be on the same terms as were all binding contract A RFP processes. Meanwhile, the bidder, Top Sale, who bid those vessels, kept those vessels on hand and actually turned down a chance to sell the vessels because it assumed contract A was going to apply because it was told it would be on the same terms as the older RFPs and didn't want to lose the chance of the contract. It didn't get that contract and thus it suffered even more damages because it now had older ships that had decreased in value. Because they picked up the phone and because the actual RFP had been kind of cobbled together from older precedents, there were some ambiguities in the language. Now, like I said, there was a clear, this is not a contract A clause. There was you know, no irrevocability clause. The evaluation criteria were very flexible, uh, but there's still this ambiguity. And there's the ambiguity of picking up the phone and binding themselves to the, and, uh, to the traditional contract ARP format. And that's what trapped tops down. That's why it's a landmine, because you have to be very careful when you're doing this. Even though contract A doesn't necessarily arise from an, a pre-qualification process. In fact, it probably doesn't arise purely from a pre-qualification. The representations made there and the fact that bidders believe they are bidding into a contract A situation based upon how it's communicated to them in that earlier process can have carryover effects later on. And it can help color the analysis as to whether or not contract A is there. It's also important what comes here is, and this is a point I'll touch on just in my closing, is to be very aware of what I call the Frankenstein RFP, where you're taking bits and pieces from older precedents, particularly precedents in the contract A world, and just assuming the clauses will work. Or just assuming that because you slap a no contract A disclaimer on top of 
an RMP, that you're okay and there is none. It has to be assessed kind of holistically. And so it has to be very careful as a purchaser and you should be very vigilant as a supplier as to whether or not that's actually been done. Now, I can't just talk about the 2013 case. So going to CG acquisition, VP1 Consulting or MP1 Consultant to use the Canadian methodology, also known as I got 150 million reasons to care with all apologies uh, to Terrell Owens. This is a case arising from uh, a solicitation by IO and the LCBO, and it was structured as an NRFP and expressly disclaimed the existence of contract A. CG Acquisitions submitted a bid and was disqualified. They wanted to raise a breach of duty of fairness. The problem was IO very intelligently, in my view, structured this as an NRFP. They said there is no contract A. They also were much better than uh, Marine Atlantic in terms of making sure that their RFP was actually an NRFP. So what CG Acquisition tried to do is they tried to claim that there was a freestanding duty of fairness and a, a duty of care just in the air outside of the contract aid framework between purchasers and bidders. And they claim that this kind of duty that exists in the air in tort extends to all bidders and covers them with substantively the same obligations as contract A, even if there is no contract A. And so they claimed for $150 million in lost profits damage. Court rejected this. The court said, no, there is no freestanding duty of fairness that exists that can be torted. They looked at the evolution in the cases since Martel, and they looked at over two decades of cases, and they started to say, look, we have some clarity now, and we know that you can choose to just not enter into contract A. And if you as a purchaser and you as a supplier have all bid on this RFP that expressly says there is no contract A, we as a court shouldn't interfere with your choice. We shouldn't come in there and say contract A exists when everyone has agreed that contract A doesn't and when there is no obvious consideration flowing. Now, what is very interesting is CG acquisition went and they cited a bunch of cases that actually held that there was a freestanding duty of fairness. And the court looked at it and the court considered the cases. And one of the things the court came back with was to say, well, look, we, we acknowledge these cases exist, but these cases all exist in the context of an administrative application of a judicial review request that's looking at the public law duties owed by public purchasers. And if you kind of read the judgment, at least in my view, it's clear that the court is more sympathetic that this kind of duty may exist in a judicial review context, but that is substantively different from bringing a tort claim. And you can't kind of conflate the two different concepts of fairness and the two different concepts of whether or not a duty exists. Not the least of which, because the thresholds on the analysis of whether or not procedural fairness duties and arbitrariness duties under public law have been met are vastly different from the duties and the assessment under tort. And so the court rejected it and the Court of Appeal here in Ontario upheld that rejection. So here we have a case of where NRFPs have been successfully used. Another case where this comes up is Murray Percha uh, and Sons. And this is out of British Columbia. Uh, and this is a case where contract A, as I like to say, is avoided like a boss. You got a road maintenance services contract that's to be fulfilled. The city in their RFP, again, structured their solicitation as a non-binding RFP process. And they included what I like to think of as a fairly standard clause to vitiate contract A. And the court cites the clause and the court kind of goes through in their analysis what the clause means. And I've popped it up there for all of your viewing pleasure. Uh, and I should note that uh, 
This presentation will be available online down the road uh, as a blog post on the firm blog. So if you want a clause that has worked at least once in the past at a court of appeal in Canada, the court was very kind to replicate it so everyone would know what it looks like. Now it's worth noting that once again, the court here continued to analyze the situation against public law duties. And it's once again clear here that there is a distinction and an importance to remember that public law duties can continue to exist even if there is no contractual relationship. Uh, and it's a very thorny issue and it's why you always have to be careful about fairness and about arbitrariness as a purchaser and vigilant about fairness and arbitrary purchase, uh, uh, arbitrary treatment as a supplier when you're engaged in an RFP process. So just some conclusions and some additional issues. One of them, as I brought up with the Marine Atlantic case is accidentally binding yourself in, uh, into contract A. So this is one that I've kind of put on here just as a thought, because this is something that's come up before. And it's a question in my mind about questions around break fees and honoraria and other bidding inducements that sometimes happen. It's probably not enough to trigger a contract A, especially in terms of you know, the practice of the industries. But it's always a question around, is this an issue that should be looked at more? And is this an issue that maybe should be considered in terms of side agreements? Like uh, we have side agreements in many RFPs for NDAs, uh, for confidentiality, in addition to agreements uh, for confidentiality in the terms of the RFP itself? Would it be better to break some of these out into separate agreements? That's one natural flow through that I've you know, started to think about. And it's one I think probably bears some actual deeper thought by the bar in this area. Uh, another one is Frankensteining. And you know, Frankenstein, great for novels, bad for solicitations. Don't just rely on your old precedents. You know, if you have one that's worked, if you have one that's withstood a contract A challenge, and said that this is non-contract A, well, then maybe you're on firmer ground. But especially if you're relying on precedents that are four or five years old, that's something that might run you into some trouble. Another question is, I'm just going to skip over the unsolicited proposals. So I note that McCarthy's, we had an unsolicited proposals uh, CPD session that should be available in our catalog that is quite excellent. But on the BPS entities in particular, which is, is judicial review even available? And that's because if you go into uh, the Judicial Review Procedures Act in Ontario, one of the clauses there actually says, you know, no entity may be subject to judicial review by reason of complying with the BPS procurement directive, which would seem to say that you can't JR someone who is a BPS entity because they violate the procurement directive. Now, there's a huge mattering in case law on this. And a lot of this is done preliminarily. And then whoever wins a summary judgment motion, you either get it dismissed or someone settles. So there's not a huge amount of case law around this in the procurement context in particular. There is one case I'm aware of involving buses uh, where a court kind of came to the decision that, well, the clause says you cannot be judicially reviewed for complying with the BPS procurement directive if the allegations that you violated the directive, you're not actually complying with the BPS procurement directive. And as such, you can be judicially reviewed. And if you win, you're right, you're immune. But if you lose, well, you, you haven't been complying with it, so you can be reviewed. That's probably outflowing from judges not liking people not having any recourse. Just particularly if you're not in contract A, your only recourse would be to judicial review. So a court, in my view, will probably try to find a way to make sure that your decision is reviewable if you're a purchaser. So final considerations, uh, try to frame any uh, solicitations as performance-based. Uh, as I like to say, not only does this spare you from potentially biasing bid specifications as a purchaser, but suppliers and bidders are often very clever and innovative. They'll think of things you have not as a purchaser. And suppliers out there, you have a lot of ingenuity 
that you can bring to the process to help deliver better value to taxpayers and to purchasers. And so solicitations that are flexible allow that to happen. Tied to this is to leave a lot of latitude for negotiations, both because it helps mitigate against a finding that contract A exists, and because, as I said above, bidders are clever and innovative. And if you allow for a greater scope of negotiation, if you allow for more flexibility in the process, suppliers will find a way to surprise you pleasantly in what they can deliver. Uh, know the purchaser's MOU or a memorandum of understanding with the province or the federal government, depending on the type of entity, its procurement policy and its rules. And that's because knowing your own rules and knowing the rules of the purchaser can give you an inside track on any judicial review you bring, because it really helps your claim to not just be grounding this in a, you have to follow contract A and they didn't, thus you should, court should read in a breach of procedural fairness, but to be able to find particular parts of an internal policy or governance that have not been changed to say that a potential procurement move has violated that policy. And the violation of the internal policy guidelines and procurement rules of the entity is a powerful piece of evidence that uh, the procedural fairness of bidders has been violated. And this is what was at the core of the Court of Appeals finding in the Rappus Gang case in the federal court. Finally, in the last one here, and I had to include this because as I was teaching on Monday, the class didn't really know what it was and it made me feel a little bit old, but follow the Bill and Ted rule of be excellent to one another. It's truly one of the best rules in my mind. It's how I always foundationally frame this, which is don't think of how you can screw over a purchaser. Don't think of how you can screw over suppliers, how you can be hyper-technical in the rules. Because the more you rely on hyper-technicality, the more risk you are going to be assuming. It's much better to be excellent to one another and to be reasonable and to always try to find what would be the kind of the fair way through because that will end up being a safer RFP process that will deliver superior results. And that will help the relationship in the long run because chances are you're either going to be with a service provider that's building you a building and then operating it or is going to be engaged in a long-term relationship or if it's a one-off, is still probably gonna have them down the road bidding on a new contract. And it's much better for everyone involved to simply be excellent. So now I'm going to flip us on over to some questions and they've come on in. Uh, so the first question I have is in NRPs, are competition rules usually contractually binding? Uh, so in this case, because we're in an NRP, as I said, it's a non-binding format uh, by its nature. There is no contract A. Uh, so if we're talking about the competition rules, we're talking about the mandatory requirements and the like. Like I said, it's probably something you have a little bit more flexibility on, particularly whether or not saying some material non-compliance. But my view is it's better to have a flexible process that has, for example, cure periods built in to eliminate non-compliances, and then have a flexible process that's rigidly adhered to than a rigid process that's flexibly adhered to. The latter, in my view, assumes a lot more risk and you're probably much better off having that flexible process from the beginning. Uh, so that was answered. Uh, the next question is, what do you respond to the observation that not making available the entirety of the contract to be ultimately signed upsets the level playing field and transparency? It's often alleged by bidders who failed in their bid, especially in relation to contract clauses that have an effect on bid price, for example, limitations on liability. You know, this is a really good question. Uh, and so I think part of it is, is saying uh, what we are putting out there is number one, we, we probably want a lot of the key terms out there. And a number of these terms are often terms that uh, are mandatory. I know, for example, that a number of provincial entities and a number of provinces have rules around not carrying contingent liabilities that at least some have interpreted to mean that there can be no liability outstanding, that there must be a strict limitation on liability clause. If a clause is truly necessary, then I think you, you put it in and you live with that. And you just say, look, we have a wide scope of negotiation, but certain clauses are must-haves. Now, in terms of the transparency, the other end of it is, 
outside of commercially sensitive terms, uh, at least at the federal level, which is where I spend a lot of my time challenging and uh, biz in front of the CITT, the standard kind of view is that the actual successful contract that goes into force is a public document that you know is a matter of the public purse, the public has a right to examine. Um, again, there's some minor restrictions there in terms of FOIA and, uh, sorry, ATIP and uh, FIPA in the province uh, that you know can raise some barriers to that. But the ultimate terms will be known. I think as long as you've made clear to bidders and bidders are fully aware when they are placing a bid, what can be negotiated and what can't be negotiated. And as long as you're not negotiating the things that you say you will not be negotiating, I think you're on a relatively safe ground because bidders will price their bid and will make their bid on the same level playing field of what to expect. Now, if your evidentiary record later shows that you are secretly in cahoots with the winning bidder and you've kind of sotto voce told them, oh, bid low or bid some other way and we'll negotiate it out later, well, then obviously you're going to be in trouble because you're in cahoots. And so you can't have that. Uh, and so uh, that's where you get into the Bill and Ted rule of being excellent, uh, avoiding that situation, because when you start bringing that sort of thing up, you're going to end up in trouble. Uh, the next question we have coming in, contract A is a blight. No one needs the torture decision making that inevitably results from bidder submissions not being exactly what was asked or expected. But I've recently seen clients asking for more of a binding approach or really more of a desire to impose contractual terms, including non-negotiable terms, uh, then it's, uh, that it has its own risks. Any thoughts on how to get the best of both worlds? And this kind of ties into the, the next question I've got from another individual of, uh, have you seen a hybrid approach used successfully? Could a purchaser say the contract we enter into must have these indemnity insurance clauses and non-negotiable, but otherwise allows the negotiation of the rest? Do you think contract A has been formed? So again, I, I think this goes into a degree of gradients. Uh, I would definitely agree with the, the statement that was put out there about contract A being a blight, as you might be able to tell. I think we'd all be better off without it. But in terms of the a hybrid approach or having certain non-negotiable terms. As I think I've kind of said earlier, in my view, it is something that's possible to have key terms that you do think are non-negotiable. Uh, and you know, just like in any commercial negotiation with another party, there will be at times where you have a term that's just non-negotiable, that there is something that to you is hyper important you can't get away from. The concern would be if the majority of your terms are non-negotiable, or even more, if like nearly all your terms are non-negotiable, but you say, you know, the color of the paper we use may be negotiated. Ha ha ha, we are now out of contract A because we are negotiating a thing. That would be very difficult. So it's not the most helpful answer in the world, I understand, partly because it's very fact specific, but you do have to look at what's being negotiated and what's not, and that can help you find that kind of middle ground. I think the, the more key terms relating to the specifications that you're negotiating, probably the less likely you're in contract A. Uh, the more those terms that it's less of a, we are bidding to negotiate and more we are bidding for this very specific thing, uh, the more those terms you have in there, the more likely you are to be in contract A. Uh, how do we push clients to be more aggressive about going into NRFPs and not fall back on safe or conservative approaches? Uh, this is a very another very good question. Uh, it can be difficult, especially because sometimes, as I said, the Bill and Ted rule would seem to indicate going to the safer approach. Uh, I always like to think of it in terms of sometimes you've got to think of it from a business risk perspective. And to try to draw analogies, and one way I try to calm a client down or try to help them with it is to try to find some of these cases like uh, the P1 consulting case, like Murray Percha, to show them these are situations where actual courts have struggled with contract A and non-contract A procurements and have successfully said that bidders can rely, uh, purchasers can rely on it. And I think that that can really help settle a client down and help them be a little bit more aggressive. 
Uh, but I'm always cognizant of the fact that at the end of the day, it's not my money. I, and, and to be fair, as I always like to tell purchasers, if they're a public purchaser, it's not your money either, because in a way it is my money. It's my money, it's your money watching this. It's my boss's money here at the farm. It's all the taxpayer's money at the end of the day, um, if it's a public purchaser situation. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm not the one that might be hit with the damages award. So I do like to help clients. I'll try to settle them and I'll try to get them the best advice and the best approach. But in cognizant, there's always a risk scale. Uh, and I think what, what's probably needed is recognition from the very top. And I don't, don't just mean the top of the civil service in these areas, but also from elected officials and also from us as voters that sometimes if you want the best results, if you want innovation, if you want the cheapest results overall, you have to accept that sometimes litigation happens and it might not go your way. Uh, and I think that that's incumbent on us as voters and our elected officials to recognize and to try to avoid a culture of blame shifting and risk aversion in a, a purchasing situation. Uh, do the trade agreements bring a duty of fairness if an NRP is chosen? Uh, these questions, I know I'm over time, so if you're logging out, by all means, uh, but I'll try to cap off these questions. Uh, the trade agreements uh, bring a duty of fairness, kind of. Uh, so the trade agreements recognize that negotiations can happen, and the trade agreements give you a much wider array of powers to structure your RFP how you want. And there are definitely the ability to do negotiations and to negotiate even key terms. Uh, and there's a, a, a fantastic CIGT case that's actually older, uh, the Xenex case, that had a negotiable format uh, back all the way in like 2007. Um, that they got in trouble not for the format, not having negotiations, not negotiating scope, not negotiating price, but just because at the end of the day, uh, when it was clear that negotiations were falling through with the top ranked proponent, they didn't uh, give them a warning. They didn't say this is your you know, last chance, best and final offer. They just took the last offer that they got and said, this isn't good enough, we're moving on, and they sent a termination letter. And that failure to provide the final chance was what the Federal Court of Appeal ultimately upheld was a breach that they should have done. But in my view, that tacitly admits that you can have a negotiable format that doesn't violate the fairness obligations owed under the trade agreements. But that is a, that is a very valid consideration because for those of you that caught my part one, the CITT is a strict, strict uh, taskmaster, a lot stricter than a lot of courts typically are. And so you've got to be thinking about that. I think in those situations, you want to be vigilant about how you describe the scope of what can be negotiated. And that gets back to the strictly following the flexible process as opposed to flexibly following the strict process. If you give yourself those room, that room in the solicitation documents, so all the bidders know what's going, going to happen, then number one, they are probably not wrong. And number two, you have to remember if you go back to that first part, and I'm assuming some of you were here for that first part, you have to think about it from the limitations perspective. Because you know, in Ontario, you have 30 days for a judicial review, the federal court, 30 days judicial review, the CITT, you have 10 business days to bring a complaint. And that's 10 business days from when you knew or reasonably ought to have known that you had the basis of a complaint. So if your complaint is that, well, they allow bid repair because they did this cure process or because they engaged in negotiations and that was us wrongful communications, unless there's something particular about how that was done that differed from what was described, in my view, the breach that would have been evident and would have been patent from when the solicitation documents get released. So if you as a bidder have, or a potential supplier have not complained about it until after the results are known, unless there's something particularly in how it was done that showed bias, in my view, you've kind of done you know, a CGI in Canada post core issue where you've kind of atorned to that process by letting that limitations period lapse. Uh, and so that kind of also addresses someone else asked a question about CETA. Um, 
someone else has asked a question uh, about the methodology of competitive dialogue. Uh, that's a question that's probably a bit too long to get into, but I'm, I'm happy to address it afterwards if you uh, want to flip me an email and we can think about that question later. And then the last question, just getting through this all, uh, have you ever seen a request for pricing in an RFQ prior to an NRFP? And regardless of that answer, what risks uh, might be of doing so? Um, so... I generally haven't. Generally speaking, what I've seen in the RFQ process is less about pricing and more about trying to gauge financial capability uh, and gauge viability in terms of a technical perspective. So that's not something I have a huge amount of insight on. Um, I think, again, it would also depend somewhat on the nature of how the RFQ was done. And I know whenever I help people with these RFQs, I'm always very keen on making clear in the RFQ process, that the RFQ is also non-binding. And the RFQ is also one that you're free to walk away from, even after you've qualified. There's no penalty. There's no security you have to post. You can keep go right out that door. And that, again, in the RFQ, all typically also say you should be very broad in saying that this is you know, just an RFQ to enter into an RFP, to enter into negotiations, to maybe get a contract. Uh, because I always try to space that out and make very clear that when we're going to be using or even might be using a negotiable RFP format later on, that we want to be clear from the outset to avoid a Marine Atlantic scenario. So that's how I would uh, touch on that one. So with that said, I think that this is just about wrapped us up for this second deep dive. I've now covered the entirety of Canadian procurement law in a two one hour sessions. Uh, no, 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 I really haven't. Uh, this is just touching on the surface of a deep dive. Uh, there's a lot of nuance. I'd encourage you all to uh, go out, discuss it with counsel or with your own internal resources. Uh, I'm always happy. My phone line is always open. Uh, again, my Twitter handle is at the trade law guy. Sometimes I will talk about procurement in amongst my other topics, including my wonderful and beloved Dallas Cowboys. Uh, but otherwise, uh, oh, do I have one last question that came in? Uh, oh, just saying thank you for the presentation. Well, thank you very much for watching. I hope you all have a lovely day and uh, may your procurements always be in your favor. Bye.